Inspired by the need to walk the talk, the dairy cattle unit at Chakwa Farm started in 1990 with one in calf heifer from the heifer project for women farmers in Impiji, HPWF. Dr. Jory Kabirizi is now an inspiration to many farmers in Uganda, East Africa, and the rest of the world. I'm Dr. Jory Kabirizi. I'm a farmer, I'm an animal scientist, I'm a researcher, and uh, I'm a zero grazer, carrying out dairy farming in an urban setting. Dr. Jolie Kabirizi has shared her expertise through published books and newspaper articles for farmers to benefit. Her farm has donated six heifers and five bulls to farmers and youth groups. Between 2014 and 2020, Chakua Farm has hosted over 3,000 stakeholders and over 23,000 have been trained through farmer workshops, farm visits and scientific workshops. Dr. Jolly Kabirizi says to start a dairy cattle enterprise in an urban area, the following need to be noted. Make a business plan. Select farm location. Research about the local milk market. Research about cattle breeds. Invest in capital. Feed your animals on a balanced diet. Create a breeding plan. Control the spread of diseases. Study dairy practices. Knowledge is power. Create a wastage management plan. Keep records for accountability purposes. At Chakwa Farm, Dr. Jolie Kabirizi says a dairy cow is the best tenant and a productive cow will produce a calf each year. Proof that you can keep a cow in a urban area as long as you follow the requirements. So first and foremost, you need to have the interest. We have been training farmers. It's very difficult to train farmers when you are not doing it yourself. Even with a small piece of land like a Muyenga, Kololo, as long as you have a market for milk, you can keep a cow. We are looking at uh, an urban setting. You can feed your cow using what we call farm wastes from the farm, the markets, and the, the, uh, the industrial agro industries. But of course, there is also these days what is called agritourism. Agritourism, that's where farmers come and learn from you. And then they go and start. What are the requirements? First of all, you need to have the interest. You must be interested. Don't go to somebody's farm, visit, and then you become excited and then start. You have to have the interest. You have to make sure that you have enough resources to start. Because zero grazing is first of all labor intensive, you must have the labor, the right type of people to manage the cow. You must have the structure where you are going to keep the cow. And most important is the feed. The feed takes almost over 80% of the total cost of what you are going to spend on that animal. And in urban setting, definitely one of the major challenges is the feed. But uh, once you know where to get the feed from, that is not a, a challenge at all. Because what we do here, is we use a lot of what we call farm waste. We contracted somebody from a win of market. That young man supplies us with sweet potato vines twice a week. Because sometimes he brings a lot. So what we do is to convert it into silage and you will see some of the silage we have. What you see on this vehicle is nothing but maize stover, which we are going to process into maize stover haylage. And that is one of the best feed for dairy farmers. Because at the moment, farmers are harvesting maize stover. And many farmers don't even know that maize stover can be a good source of feed. Then, of course, the other, the other, the other feeds are what you we get from the, like the Uganda breweries, the spent grain. Then you have the what we call the brewers yeast solution. That solution is very good when you mix it with molasses, but it's also good when you are feeding because we are looking at urban, urban, uh, an urban farmer without land. So most of our feeds are purchased. Feeds like a Chloris Guyana, the hay, the dry grass, they call the dry grass. Fortunately, these people, these days it's a business. Many people with a lot of land, they are producing pastures for sale to urban and peri-urban farmers. As long as you know the source, you have to, before you start, before you go in for zero grazing, 
you have to look at where am I going to get this, the feed. Because you don't want to lose animals because the animal has been underfed. When you start zero grazing, you have to look at the type of animals. The type of animal or animals you are going to keep. Here we keep crosses and many people wonder why we keep crosses. We keep crosses first and foremost because they are easier to manage. We keep crosses because in terms of what we call consumption, how much they eat per day is much lower than the exotics, the Frisians, these huge animals, because the animal consumes based on the body weight. Then, of course, you also look at the milk. Crosses produce better milk, in, better in terms of butter fat content, than the pure ones. These exotics, they are very good. Exotics, especially the black and white, the Frisians. They are very good animals. They produce a lot of milk as long as you feed them. But the challenge is, their mil the, is the type of milk they, they produce. And especially around this time when there is a lot of green, fresh, fresh, fresh grass with a lot of moisture. It will take you time and the real efforts to convince your customers that you are not adding water. So that's why we are keeping the crosses. They are tolerant to most of the diseases. So if you want to start a zero grazing unit, you also have to look at the market. Do you have customers who are going to buy the milk? Because zero grazing is labor intensive and it requires some money. You have to make sure that you have good market. Here, we, our, the market is not a problem because we sell our milk at 2,300. And because of the quality, we insist on quality. Of course, quality depends on the animal, but it also depends on the type of feeding. These farmers, of course, they start lining up for our milk at five. And we're happy with them. We have been keeping some of these farmers for more than 20 years. By the way, we started in 1990. The starting was not easy, but uh, for me, I always believe in whenever you get a challenge, you turn it into opportunity. Those challenges we got, they helped us to learn a lot and to, to be where we are today. A zero grazing structure, of course, it has to, it has to have where the animal feeds from, the, feed, the feeding troughs, the water troughs, the, resting, the, the cubicles where the animal can rest, then where the animals can be treated. My structure is very simple and uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. The animals uh, give me some, at least a reasonable amount of milk. And what we feed, this is an urban setting. What we feed, what we see here is grass. This is the uh, Chloris Guyana Rhodes grass here. This is purchased feed. We buy it from a certain doctor who, has, who is specializing in producing hay for sale. Then in, in these drums here, these drums, there is the uh, Brewers spent grain, we use it at milking time. The unfortunate part, many farmers think that the animal can survive on brewers spent grain from morning to evening. That is very wrong. And then when you buy brewers spent grain, you have to know the type because there are two types. There's one that is made from sorghum, then there's one that comes from, made from barley. The sorghum brewers, the, the, the one that is made from sorghum, has a lot of challenges because of what we call anti-nutrients. And if you feed it too much, you are likely to lose that animal. So we only pro provide brewer spent grain at milking time. Then we have, we have sugar cane bagas. Sugar cane bagas, we, get, we buy it from, there's a certain Indian in Bunga. In fact, that is one of the product the product, sugarcane burgers from the sugarcane industry. We, this one, what we do, we process it into sugarcane bag haylage. This is done by mixing those, these two, two molasses and the brewer's yeast solution in a ratio of one to two. And then you ferment for, for 30 days. By the end of the 30 days, it will be, it will, the, 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 in fact, it will be a completely different product. Then we have the maize tover. All this, all what you see on this vehicle is made of uh, all these bags. In fact, I have about more than 200 bags, and those 200 bags can take me for another six months. This is the maize of uh, hellage. What, what, what you get after fermenting it with the same, same, what, same, same ingredients. Because the maize of alone and the sugarcane bagasse alone, in terms of protein content, is very low. 
And of course, for dairy cows and especially milking cows, they need a certain level of protein content. Below that, they will start losing weight, but not only that, they will produce very little milk. This Mexican sunflower has a lot of protein content. So, because we want to improve the protein content of this stuff, we go around and have this one is found everywhere uh, along the roadside. It is called Mexican sunflower. So we harvest it, either we eat it or make it into make it into into powder. This is the same. This product is from here, from the same. So and then we mix with this, all this, all the mix of and then that and then we ferment. At the end of the day, because this one alone in terms of protein content might even be less than four percent. But if you mix it with this Mexican sunflower, molasses, yeast, brewers, yeast solution, you are likely to get a protein content of over 10. A lactating cow should have at least a minimum of 16%, 16% in terms of protein content. But you are also talking in terms of energy. The energy will come from the brewer's spent grain. Then we have this. These are, the, these are banana peelings. You can't believe that this banana peelings, this is the same product. This one in terms of powder. These are what we do, we get the banana peelings and dry them and mill them into powder, powder form. This is the dry banana peelings. This is the powder. This one, what we what we mix it with the this stuff here, Mexican sunflower. Then we also mix it with the this is what is called pottery. Kalimbo and coco, kalimbo nak and from the pottery portray unit, this one. So we mix these three products and then we supplement our animals. I've been trying to encourage farmers, especially portrait farmers, not to, of course, this one is a, is a very good source of fertilizer. Many people use it as a fertilizer. But at the moment, of course, with urban farming, I've been encouraging these people, especially farmers with KD birds, to, to, dry, to get solar dryers and then dry this stuff and pack it and then of course it can be a very good source of income income because it's a very good source of feed and especially for pigs you can also use it to feed pigs but it's also very good as a, a feed for dairy cattle if you cut if you mix it with other other feeds we have that block this block that block is locally made this is what we call the compressed compressed complete sweet potato silage feed block why do we have to again after making sweet after making the silage why do we have again to convert it into the block what is happening is many of these people were selling silage they use the method that is called the the tube silo the black polythene tubes so during the transportation sometimes in fact they tear out and of course once air enters then you lose the silage. So what for, for us, what we do after making the silage, we convert it into the block. It is, very, it is easier to store that block than storing the silage. The challenge with storing the silage, once it matures, you know there is a very good smell. Then the rats start, of course, they, you get problems with the rats. And once air enters, then it starts rotting. So, we convert it into the block. We have a, small, a simple solar dryer where we dry them. If you want to feed your cow on this, it will be like feeding your child on cassava alone. Of course, at the end of the day, the baby will get kwashako. But if you feed that baby with cassava and then beans, beans, they be, of course, the beans are all ground nuts, you are, you'll be trying to balance at least because you are providing, providing the protein you're also providing the carbohydrates. Under zero grazing, the major disease is East Coast fever. But you can always control East Coast fever as long as you. Because here, we don't spray. We use what we call the, we use the spot on. Spot on, we have few animals, so spraying becomes labor intensive. Labor intensive. So this one is just power at the back, and then that is done once a week. The second disease is mastitis, but mastitis is mainly, it could be genetic, but in most cases, it is due to poor hygiene. Because under zero grazing, and especially in urban centers, the major challenge is the manure disposal. So people tend to leave the manure to accumulate in the, in the grazing unit. 
So at the end of the day, if you have a lactating cow, the germs will enter the teats, and that will be the source of all problems. There are diseases, of course, which can be controlled through vaccinations. There are diseases which can be controlled through proper hygiene. And there are diseases, I mean, like worms, you just do worm. Then you, when you move around, you will see a lot, a number of these cards, blue, yellow, blue. It has nothing to do with politics. These blue cards, even there are so many in the, in the zero grazing unit. This is one way of controlling flies. These are called insect, sticky insect traps. So they will trap whatever fly or insect that comes. That's why you don't see any fly here. But you visit some of these farmers. The flies will welcome you. And it's not, it's not good because it can also be a source of, uh, source of disease, but it also inconveniences the, the, what, the farmers. When it comes to manure disposal, how do we dispose of manure? Behind this place, we see a small pit, a cemented pit. What we do, we put, we remove the manure from the, from the grazing unit, put it in that cemented pit, disinfect it, and then cover it. We have so many customers who come to buy it, but then we also use the same manure to make charcoal briquettes. So here we save a lot on, on fuel. So we use the charcoal briquettes to cook. We don't sell them, but we use them to cook. A cubicle should be at least seven feet seven feet it should be enough for the animal to fit in and it also depends on the size of the animal some of these animals are too small because of course you can say seven 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 feet long and then why why they about four feet why a cubic it can be more it can be less depending on the size of the animal some of these animals are too small some of the animals but you should be having a place where there's water permanently you should be having a place what the feed troughs and those feed troughs should be having feed throughout 24 7. the amount of milk you get depends on so many factors first of all the uh, the number of lactations how many animal how many times the animal has calved it down or produced the stage of lactation how many months because in most cases when the animal produces or calves down the animal the milk yield of course continues to 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 increase up to around three months then it goes down. There's a reason why it, it stabilizes a bit, then it goes down. We assume that around three months after the animal has, calv has calved, after that it goes down, of course, because of the, the demands. The animal is, is lactating, at the same time it's in calf. So in most cases, many, many times many farmers don't provide the, the, the required amounts and co co the quality and the quantity. The animal requires, that's why many animals, in fact, that's why many animals lose weight after calving down. But here, our milk pro production ranges between 15 liters to 32 liters, and these are crosses. Yes, but it also varies depending on the type of feed we have given uh, the animal, whether the animal is sick. By the way, we rarely get sick animals here because we try to control the diseases as much as possible. This is a small area. And then we also try to make sure that we keep the place clean. We also disinfect the, the zero grazing, the unit. We use, there's a disinfectant, which of course some people call it gas, but it, it's called kero, kero. So after removing the manure, then cleaning the place, then we, 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 we disinfect the place so that it doesn't smell. I think I've trained farmers. For me, I'm, I'm so proud that at least I've contributed a lot to, to the different communities. I've trained farmers. People have, come, people have come here and they got information they wanted. And they have really appreciated. But all you know, zero grazing is good. And the urban zero grazing is good because there is good market for milk. But you have to tighten your belt. And first get the right information. The right information that will enable you to make it a profitable enterprise. Don't think you are going to keep to buy this to buy this animal and start uh, roaming all over the place and you think somebody because you employed somebody to take care of that animal. You will just die before that animal dies. <laughs> Just die of heart attack when you get to know what exactly happens. That's why our motto is farmer's food is the best manure.